Chapter 8 of the Story of a Common Soldier of Army Life in the Civil War, 1861-1865. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. The Story of a Common Soldier of Army Life in the Civil War, 1861-1865 by Leander Stilwell. Chapter 8. Bolivar, the movement to the vicinity of Iuka, Mississippi, September, December, 1862. On September 16th, the regiment, with the rest of our brigade, left Bolivar on the cars, went to Jackson, and thence to Corinth, Mississippi, where we arrived about sundown. From here, still on the cars, we started east on the Memphis and Charleston Railroad. The train proceeded very slowly, and after getting about seven or eight miles from Corinth, it stopped, and we passed the rest of the night on the cars. Early next morning the train started, and we soon arrived at the little town of Burnsville, about fifteen miles southeast of Corinth, where we left the cars and went into bivouac near the eastern outskirts of the town. On the morning of the 19th, before daylight, we marched about two miles east of Burnsville and formed in line of battle, facing the south in thick woods consisting mainly of tall pines. It was talked among us that the Confederate pickets were only a short distance from our front, and it certainly looked like a battle was impending. By this time the military situation was pretty well understood by all of us, a Confederate force of about 8,000 men, under General Sterling Price, was in the town of Iuka, about two miles south of us, and General Grant and General Rosecrans had formulated a plan for attacking this force on two sides at once. General Rosecrans was to attack from the south, while our column, under the immediate command of General E. O. C. Ord, was to close in from the north. General Grant was on the field and was with the troops on the north. The plan was all right, and doubtless would have succeeded, if the wind, on September 19, 1862, in that locality, had been blowing from the south instead of the north. It is on such seemingly little things that the fate of battles, and sometimes that of nations, depends. General Rosecrans, on the afternoon of the 19th, encountered the enemy south of Iuka, had a severe battle, and was quite roughly handled. Only a few miles to the north was all of Ord's command, in line of battle, and expecting to go in every minute. But the order never came. So all day we just stood around in those pine woods, wondering what in the world was the matter. As already stated, the woods were dense, and the wind blowing from the north carried from us all sounds of the battle. I personally know this was the case. There were a few cannon shots next morning, fired by a battery in General Rosecrans's column, and those we distinctly heard from our position, and thought at the time they indicated a battle, but they were fired mainly as feelers and to ascertain if the enemy were present in force. But as stated, all day on the 19th we heard not a sound to indicate that a desperate battle was in progress only a few miles from our front. Early in the morning of the 19th, I witnessed an incident that inspired in me my first deep-seated hatred of whiskey, and which has abided with me ever since. We had formed in line of battle, but the command had been given, in place, rest, which we were allowed to give a liberal construction, and we were scattered around, standing or sitting down near the line. About this time two young assistant surgeons came from the rear, riding up the road on which the left of the regiment rested. They belonged to some infantry regiment of the division, but personally I didn't know them. They were both fool drunk. On reaching our line of battle they stopped, but kept in their saddles, pulling their horses about, playing smarty, and grinning and chattering like a brace of young monkeys. I looked at those drunk young fools and thought that, maybe in less than an hour, 
one of them might be standing over me, probing a bullet wound in one of my legs, and then and there promptly deciding the question whether the leg should be sawed off or whether it could be saved. And what kind of intelligent judgment on this matter, on which my life or death might depend, could this whiskey-crazed young gosling be capable of exercising? I felt so indignant at the condition and conduct of these men right on the eve of what we supposed might be a severe battle, and in which their care for the wounded would be required, that it almost seemed to me it would be doing the government good service to shoot both the galoots right on the spot. And there were other boys who felt the same way, who began making ominous remarks. The drunken young wretches seemed to have sense enough to catch the drift of something that was said. They put spurs to their horses and galloped off to the rear, and we saw them no more. On the morning of the 20th, some regiments of our division moved forward and occupied the town of Iuka, but General Price had in the meantime skipped out, so there was no fighting. Our regiment, with some others, remained in the original position so that I never got to see the old town of Iuka until several years after the war. Sometime during the afternoon of the 20th, I went to Captain Reddish and said to him that I had become so tired of just standing around and asked him if I could take a short stroll in the woods. The old man gave his consent, as I felt satisfied he would, but cautioned me not to go too far away. The main thing in view when I made the request was the hope of finding some wild muscadine grapes. They were plentiful in this section of the country, and were now ripe, and I wanted a bait. I think a wild muscadine grape is just the finest fruit of that kind in existence. When ripe, it has a strong and most agreeable fragrance, and when one is to the leeward of a vine loaded with grapes, and a gentle wind is blowing from the south, he is first made aware of their proximity by their grateful odor. I soon found some on this occasion, and they were simply delicious. Having fully satisfied my craving, I proceeded to make my way back to the regiment. When, hearing the trampling sound of cavalry, I hurried through the woods to the side of the road, reaching there just as the head of the column appeared. It was only a small body, not more than a hundred or so, and there, riding at its head, was Grant. I had not seen him since the Battle of Shiloh, and I looked at him with intense interest. He had on an old sugar-loaf hat with limp, drooping brim, and his outer coat was the ordinary uniform coat with a long cape of a private in the cavalry. His footgear was cavalry boots splashed with mud, and the ends of his trousers' legs were tucked inside the boots. No shoulder straps were visible, and the only evidence of rank about him that was perceptible consisted of a frayed and tarnished gold cord on his hat. He was looking downward as he rode by, and seemed immersed in thought. As the column passed along, I asked a soldier near the rear what troops they were, and he answered, Company A, 4th Illinois Cavalry, General Grant's escort. This was the last time that I saw Grant during the war. On the evening of the 20th, the regiment was drawn back into Burnsville, and that night Company D bivouacked in the Harrison Hotel, which formerly had evidently been the principal hotel in the town. It was a rambling, roomy, old frame building, two stories and a half high, now vacant, stripped of all furniture, and with a thick layer of dust and dirt on the floors. We occupied a room on the second floor that evidently had been the parlor. Being quartered in a hotel was a novel experience, and the boys got lots of fun out of it. One would call out, Bill, ring the clerk to send up a pitcher of ice water and to be quick about it. While another would say, And while you're at it, tell him to note a special order from me for quail on toast for breakfast, and so on. But these pleasantries soon subsided, and it was not long before we were wrapped in slumber. It was a little after midnight, and I was sound asleep when I heard someone calling, Sergeant Stillwell, where is Sergeant Stillwell? I sprang to my feet and answered, Here, what's wanted? The speaker came to me, and then I saw it was Lieutenant Goodspeed, 
who was acting as adjutant of the regiment. He proceeded to inform me that I was to take charge of a detail of three corporals and twelve men and go to a point about a mile and a half east of Burnsville to guard a party of section men while clearing and repairing the railroad from a recent wreck. He gave me full instructions and then said, Stillwell, a lieutenant should go in charge of this detail, but all that I could find made pretty good excuses, and I think you'll do. It is a position of honor and responsibility, as there are some prowling bands of guerrillas in this vicinity, so be careful and vigilant. I was then acting as first sergeant, and really was exempt from this duty, but of course the idea of making that claim was not entertained for a moment. I took charge of my party, went to where the laborers were waiting for us with hand cars, and we soon arrived at the scene of the wreck. A day or two before our arrival at Burnsville, a party of Confederate cavalry had torn up the track at this point and wrecked and burnt a freight train. Some horses on the train had been killed in the wreck. Their carcasses were lying around and were rather offensive. The trucks and other ironwork of the cars were piled on the track, tangled up and all out of shape. Some rails removed and others warped by heat and things generally in a badly torn-up condition. The main dirt road forked here, one fork going diagonally to the right of the track and the other to the left, both in an easterly direction. I posted three men and a corporal about a quarter of a mile to the front on the track, a similar squad at the same distance on each fork of the dirt road, and the others at intervals on each side of the railroad at the place of the wreck. The laborers went to work with a will, and about the time the owls were hooting for day, the foreman reported to me that the track was clear, the rails replaced, and that they were ready to return to Burnsville. I then drew in my guards, we got on the hand cars, and were soon back in town, and thus ended my first and only personal supervision of the work of repairing a break in a railroad. I barely had time to make my coffee and toast a piece of bacon when the bugle sounded fall in, and soon, that being the morning of September 21st, we started on the back track, and that day marched to Corinth. It so happened that on this march our regiment was at the head of the column. The proper place of my company, according to Army regulations, was the third from the right or head of the line but from some cause I never knew what, on that day we were placed at the head, and as I was then acting as first sergeant of our company, that put me the head man on foot. These details are mentioned for the reason that all that day I marched pretty close to the tail of the horse that General Ord was riding, and with boyish curiosity I scanned the old general closely. He was a graduate of West Point, and an old regular. He had served in the Florida and the Mexican Wars, and he also had been in much scrapping with hostile Indians in the vicinity of the Pacific Coast. He looked old to me, but really he was at this time only about forty-four years of age. He certainly was indifferent to his personal appearance, as his garb was even plainer and more careless than Grant's. He wore an old battered felt hat with a flapping brim, and his coat was one of the old-fashioned, long-tailed, oil-cloth, wrap rascals then in vogue. It was all splattered with mud, with several big torn places in it. There was not a thing about him that I could see to indicate his rank. Later he was transferred to the Eastern Armies, eventually was assigned to the command of the Army of the James and took an active and prominent part in the operations that culminated in the surrender of Lee at Appomattox. We reached Corinth that evening, went into bivouac, and remained there a couple of days. On the morning of September 24th, we fell in, marched down to the depot, climbed on cars, and were soon being whirled north to Jackson on the Mobile and Ohio Railroad. We arrived there about noon and at once transferred to a train on the Mississippi Central Track, and which forthwith started for Bolivar. I think the train we came on to Jackson went right back to Corinth to bring up more troops. We
we common soldiers could not imagine what this hurried rushing around meant, and it was some time before we found out. But history shows that Grant was much troubled about this time as to whether a threatened Confederate attack would be delivered at Corinth or at Bolivar. However, about the 22nd, the indications were that Bolivar would be assailed, and troops were at once brought from Corinth to resist this apprehended movement of the Confederates. This probably is a fitting place for something to be said about our method of traveling by rail during the Civil War, as compared with the conditions of the present day in that regard. At the time I am now writing, about 15,000 United States soldiers have recently been transported on the cars from different places in the interior of the country to various points adjacent to the Mexican border for the purpose of protecting American interests, and it seems that in some cases the soldiers were carried in ordinary passenger coaches. Thereupon bitter complaints were made on behalf of such soldiers because Pullman sleepers were not used, and these complaints were effective, too, for according to the press reports of the time, the use of passenger coaches for such purposes was summarily stopped, and Pullmans were hurriedly concentrated at the places needed, and the soldiers went to war in them. Well, in our time, the old regiment was hauled over the country many times on trains, the extent of our travels in that manner aggregating hundreds and hundreds of miles, and such a thing as even ordinary passenger coaches for the use of the enlisted men was never heard of, and I have no recollection now that, during the war, any were provided for the use of the commissioned officers either, unless they were of pretty high rank. The cars that we rode in were the box or freight cars in use in those days. Among them were cattle cars, flat or platform cars, and, in general, every other kind of freight car that could be procured. We would fill the box cars, and, in addition, clamber upon the roofs thereof and avail ourselves of every foot of space. And usually there was a bunch on the cow-catchers. The engines used wood for fuel, and the screens of the smokestacks must have been very coarse, or maybe they had none at all, and the big cinders would patter down on us like hail. So when we came to the journey's end, by reason of the cinders and soot, we were about as dirty and black as any regiment of sure enough colored troops that fought under the Union flag in the last years of the war. When the regiment was sent home in September 1865, some months after the war was over, the enlisted men made even that trip in our old friends the box cars. It is true that on this occasion there was a passenger coach for the use of the commissioned officers, and that is the only time that I ever saw such a coach attached to a train on which the regiment was taken anywhere. Now, don't misunderstand me. I am not kicking because more than a half a century after the close of the Civil War, Uncle Sam sent his soldier boys to the front in Pullmans. The force so sent was small, and the government could well afford to do it, and it was right. I just want you to know that in my time, when we rode, it was in any kind of an old freight car, and we were awful glad to get that. And now, on this matter, the words of Job are ended. The only railroad accident I ever happened to be in was one that befell our train as we were in the act of leaving Jackson on the afternoon of the 24th. There was a good deal of hurry and confusion when we got on the cars, and it looked like it was every fellow for himself. Jack Medford, my chum, and I were running along the side of the track looking for a favorable situation when we came to a flat car about the middle of the train, as yet unoccupied. Jack, said I, let's get on this one. He was a little slow of speech. He stopped, looked, and commenced to say something but his hesitation lost us the place, and was fraught with other consequences. Right at that moment a bunch of the 12th Michigan, on the other side of the track, piled on the car quicker than a flash, and took up all available room. Jack and I then ran forward and climbed on top of a box car, next to the tender of the engine, 
and soon after the train started. It had not yet got under full headway, and was going only about as fast as a man could walk, when, from some cause, the rails spread, and the first car to leave the rails was the flat above mentioned. But its trucks were bouncing along on the ties, and doubtless nobody would have been hurt had it not been for the fact that the car plunged into a cattle guard of the kind then in use. This guard was just a hole dug in the track, probably four or five feet deep, the same in length, and in width extending from rail to rail. Well, the front end of the car went down into that hole, and then the killing began. They stopped the train very quickly. The entire event couldn't have lasted more than half a minute, but that flat car was torn to splinters. Three soldiers on it were killed dead, being frightfully crushed and mangled, and several more were badly injured. The men on the car jumped in every direction when the car began breaking up, and so the most of them escaped unhurt. If the train had been going at full speed, other cars would have been involved, and there is simply no telling how many would have been killed and wounded. On what little things does the fate of man sometimes depend? If, in response to my suggestion, Jack Medford had promptly said, All right, we would have jumped on that flat car, and then would have been caught in the smash-up. But he took a mere fraction of time to look and think, and that brief delay was, perhaps, our temporal salvation. We arrived at Bolivar during the afternoon of the 24th, and reoccupied our old camp. The work of fortifying that place was pushed with renewed vigor, and strong lines of breastworks with earthen forts at intervals were constructed, which practically enclosed the entire town. But we never had occasion to use them. Not long after our return to Bolivar, General Grant became satisfied that the point the enemy would assail was Corinth, so the most of the troops at Bolivar were again started to Corinth to aid in repelling the impending attack. But this time they marched overland. Our regiment and two others, with some artillery, were left to garrison Bolivar. And so it came to pass that the Battle of Corinth was fought, on our part, by the command of General Rosecrans on October 4th, and the Battle of Hatchie Bridge the next day by the column from Bolivar under the command of General Ord and we missed both battles. For my part, I then felt somewhat chagrined that we didn't get to take part in either of those battles. Here we had been rushed around the country, from pillar to post, hunting for trouble, and then to miss both these fights was just a little mortifying. However, the common soldier can only obey orders and stay where he is put, and doubtless it was all for the best. Early on the morning of October 9th, a force of about 4,000 men, including our regiment, started from Bolivar, marching southwest on the dirt road. We arrived at Grand Junction at dark, after a march of about 20 miles. Grand Junction was the point where the Memphis and Charleston and the Mississippi Central Railroads crossed. We had not much more than stacked arms, and, of course, before I had time to cook my supper, when I was detailed for picket, and was on duty all night. But I didn't go supperless by any means, as I made coffee and fried some bacon at the picket post. Early next morning the command fell in line, and we all marched back to Bolivar again. We had hardly got started before it began to rain, and just poured down all day long. But the weather was pleasant, we took off our shoes and socks and rolled up our breeches after the manner heretofore described and just socked on through the yellow mud whooping and singing and as wet as drowned rats we reached bolivar some time after dark the boys left there in camp in some way had got word that we were on the return and had prepared for us some camp kettles full of hot strong coffee with plenty of fried sow belly so we had a good supper. What the object of the expedition was, and what caused us to turn back, I have never learned, 
or if I did, have now forgotten. On returning to Bolivar, we settled down to the usual routine of battalion drill and standing picket. The particular guard duty the regiment performed nearly all the time we were at Bolivar, with some casual exceptions, was guarding the railroad from the bridge over Hatchie River north to Toon Station, a distance of about seven miles. Toon Station, as its name indicates, was nothing but a stopping point with a little rusty-looking old frame depot and a switch. The usual tour of guard duty was twenty-four hours all the while I was in the service, except during this period of railroad guarding, and for it the time was two days and nights. Every foot of the railroad had to be vigilantly watched to prevent its being torn up by bands of guerrillas or disaffected citizens. One man with a crowbar, or even an old axe, could remove a rail at a culvert or at some point on a high grade and cause a disastrous wreck. I liked this railroad guard duty. Between Bolivar and Toons the road ran through dense woods, with only an occasional little farm on either side of the road, and it was pleasant to be out in those fine old woods and far away from the noise and smells of the camps. And there are so many things that are strange and attractive to be seen and heard when one is standing alone on picket, away out in some lonesome place in the middle of the night. I think that a man who has never spent some wakeful hours in the night by himself out in the woods has simply missed one of the most interesting parts of life. The night is the time when most of the wild things are astir, and some of the tame ones, too. There was some kind of a very small frog in the swamps and marshes near Bolivar that gave forth about the most plaintive little cry that I ever heard. It was very much like the bleeding of a young lamb, and on hearing it the first time, I thought sure it was from some little lamb that was lost or in distress of some kind. I never looked the matter up to ascertain of what particular species those frogs were. They may be common throughout the South, but I never heard this particular call except around and near Bolivar. And the woods between Bolivar and Toons were full of owls, from great big fellows with a thunderous scream, down to the little screech owls, who made only a sort of chattering noise. One never-failing habit of the big owls was to assemble in some grove of tall trees just about daybreak and have a morning concert that could be heard half a mile away. And there were also whippoorwills and mockingbirds, and during the pleasant season of the year myriads of insects that would keep sounding their shrill little notes the greater part of the night. And the only time one sees a flying squirrel, unless you happen to cut down the tree in whose hollow he is sleeping, is in the night time. Then they are abroad in full force. When on picket in my army days, I found out that dogs are great nocturnal ramblers. I have been on guard at a big tree on some grass-grown country road when something would be heard coming down the road towards me. Pat, pat, pity pat. Then it would stop short. The night might be too dark for me to see it, but I knew it must be a dog. It would stand silent for a few seconds, evidently closely scrutinizing that man alone under the tree with something like a long, shining stick in his hands. Then it would stealthily leave the road and would be heard rustling through the leaves as it made a half-circle through the woods to get by me. On reaching the road below me, its noise would cease for a little while, it was then looking back over its shoulder to see if that man was still there. Having satisfied itself on that point, then, pat, pat, pity pat, and it went off in a trot down the road. When you see an old farm dog asleep in the sun on the porch in the daytime, with his head between his paws, it is, as a general rule, safe to assume that he was up and on a scout all the previous night, and maybe traveled ten or fifteen miles. Cats are also confirmed night prowlers, but I don't think they wander as far as dogs. Later, when we were in Arkansas, sometimes a full-grown bear would walk up to some drowsy picket and give him the surprise of his life. 
One quiet, starlit summer night, while on picket between Bolivar and Tunes, I had the good fortune to witness the flight of the largest and most brilliant meteor I have ever seen. It was a little after midnight, and I was standing alone at my post, looking, listening, and thinking. Suddenly there came a loud, rushing, roaring sound, like a passenger train close by, going at full speed, and then there in the west was a meteor. Its flight was from the southwest to the northeast, parallel with the horizon and low down. Its head or body looked like a huge ball of fire, and it left behind a long, immense tail of brilliant white that lighted up all the western heavens. While yet in full view, it exploded with a crash like a nearby clap of thunder. There was a wide, glittering shower of sparks, and then silence and darkness. The length of time it was visible could not have been more than a few seconds, but it was a most extraordinary spectacle. On October 19th, the regiment, except those on guard duty, went as escort of a foraging expedition to a big plantation about twelve miles from Bolivar down the Hatchie River. We rode there and back in the big government wagons, each wagon being drawn by a team of six mules. Like Joseph's brethren, when they went down into Egypt, we were after corn. The plantation we foraged was an extensive one on the fertile bottom land of the Hatchie River, and the owner that year had grown several hundred acres of corn, which had all been gathered or shocked, and we just took it as we found it. The people evidently were wealthy for that time and locality. Many slaves were on the place, and it was abounding in livestock and poultry of all kinds. The plantation in general presented a scene of rural plenty and abundance that reminded me of the home of old Baltus Van Tassel, as described by Washington Irving in the story of the legend of Sleepy Hollow, with this difference. Everything about the Tennessee plantation was dirty out of order, and in general higgledy-piggledy condition. And the method of farming was slovenly in the extreme. The cultivated land had been cleared by cutting away the underbrush and small trees, while the big ones had merely been deadened by girdling them near the ground. These dead trees were all standing in ghastly nakedness, and so thick in many places that it must have been difficult to plow through them while flocks of crows and buzzards were sailing around them or perched in their tops, cawing and croaking, and thereby augmenting the woebegone look of things. The planter himself was of a type then common in the South. He was a large, coarse-looking man with an immense paunch, wore a broad-brimmed homemade straw hat and butternut jeans clothes. His trousers were of the old-fashioned broad fall pattern. His hair was long, he had a scraggy, sandy beard, and chewed long green tobacco continually and viciously. But he was shrewd enough to know that ugly talk on his part wouldn't mend matters, but only make them worse. So he stood around in silence while we took his corn, but he looked as malignant as a rattlesnake. His wife was directly his opposite in appearance and demeanor. She was tall, thin, and bony, with reddish hair and a sharp nose and chin. And goodness, but she had a temper. She stood in the door of the dwelling house and just tongue-lashed us Yankees, as she called us, to the full extent of her ability. The boys took it all good-naturedly and didn't jaw back. We couldn't afford to quarrel with a woman. A year later the result of her abuse would have been the stripping of the farm of every hog and head of poultry on it, but at this time the orders were strict against indiscriminate individual foraging, and except one or two bee stands full of honey, nothing was taken but the corn. And I have no doubt that long ere this the government has paid that planter, or his heirs, a top-notch price for everything we took. It seems to be easy nowadays to get a special act through Congress making full compensation in cases of that kind. Not long after the foregoing expedition, I witnessed a somewhat amusing incident one night on the picket line. 
One day, for some reason, the regiment was required, in addition to the railroad guards, to furnish a number of men for picket duty. First Lieutenant Sam T. Carrico of Company B was the officer, and it fell to my lot to be the sergeant of the guard. We picketed a section of the line a mile or so southwest of Bolivar, and the headquarters post where the lieutenant and the sergeant of the guard stayed was at a point on a main traveled road running southwest from the town. It was in the latter part of October, and the night was a bad and cold one. Lieutenant Carrico and I had doubled up, spread one of our blankets on the ground, and, with the other drawn over us, were lying down and trying to doze a little, when, about ten o'clock, we heard a horseman coming at full speed from the direction of Bolivar. We thereupon rose to a sitting posture and awaited developments. The horseman, on nearing our post and being challenged, responded, Friend, without the countersign and, in a peremptory manner, told the sentinel on duty that he wanted to see the officer of the guard. Lieutenant Carrico and I walked up to the horseman, and, on getting close to him, saw that he was a Union officer of the rank of captain. Addressing himself to the lieutenant in a loud and hasty manner, he told him his story, which in substance was that he was captain, giving his name, on General Grant's staff, that he had just arrived in Bolivar on the train from Memphis, that he had an important business a few miles outside of the lines, and, being in a great hurry, he had not gone to post headquarters to get the countersign, as he felt satisfied that the statement of his rank and business would be sufficient to ensure his being passed through the picket line, and so on. Lieutenant Carrico listened in silence until the fellow finished, and then said quietly, but very firmly, "'Captain, if you claim to be General Grant himself, you shouldn't pass through my line without the countersign.' At this the alleged staff officer blew up and thundered and bullied at a great rate. Carrico was not much more than a boy, being only about twenty-two years old and of slight build, but he kept perfectly cool and remained firm as a rock. Finally, the officer wheeled his horse around and started back to town at a furious gallop. Carrico then walked up to the sentinel on duty and said to him, Now, if that fellow comes back, you challenge him, and make him conform to every item of the Army regulations, and to make sure about it, he gave the guard specific instructions as to his duties in such cases. We stood around and waited, and it was not long before we heard the horseman returning, at his usual rate of speed. He never checked his gait until the challenge of the sentinel rang out, Halt! Who comes there? Friend with the countersign was the answer. Dismount, friend, advance, and give the countersign, cried the sentinel. Kassock went the fine high-top boots of the rider in the mud, and leading his horse, he walked up, gave the talismanic word, to which the response was made, Countersign's correct, pass, friend. The officer then sprang into the saddle and rode up to the lieutenant and me. Taking a memorandum book and pencil from one of his pockets, he said to Carrico, Give me your name, company, and regiment, sir. Samuel T. Carrico, first lieutenant, company B, 61st Illinois Infantry. The officer scribbled in his notebook, then turned to me. And yours? Leander Stillwell, Sergeant, Company D, 61st Illinois Infantry, and that answer was also duly recorded. Good night, gentlemen. You'll render an account of this outrage later. And with this parting salutation, the officer galloped away. All right, Carrico called after him. You know where to find us. The victim of the outrage had not returned when we were relieved at nine o'clock the next morning and we never saw or heard of him any more. Of course, his threat on leaving us was pure bluff, for Lieutenant Carrico had only done his plain and simple duty. The fellow was probably all right. His returning with the countersign would indicate it. But his important business was doubtless simply to keep a date with some lady love out in the country, and he wanted to meet her under the friendly cover of night. A few words will here be said in the nature of a deserved tribute to Lieutenant Carrico. Later he rose to the rank of captain of his company, 
and was one among the very best and bravest of the line officers of the regiment. He had nerves like hammered steel, and was as cool a man in action as I have ever known. Of all the officers of the regiment who were mustered in at its organization, he is now the only survivor. He is living at Alva, Oklahoma, and is a hale, hearty old man. End of chapter 8